and apply this yourself if you're interested, which most people are. Who's, who's heard of probiotics? It's, it's all over the press now. <coughs> it's all over the Walgreens and Walmart and everything else. And, and I will say, it's not just a passing, it is not just a passing phase or, or a little hobby. Probiotics, in my mind, is really the coolest thing that's hit, certainly infectious diseases, for years. And it's probably one of the coolest things that's hit medicine for the last 50 years. It's really cool. The research has exploded, and it continues to explode. Uh, and I'll uh, tell you a little about it. And please don't hesitate to interrupt. Charlene, I know, will interrupt regularly. <laughs> so the rest of you should feel as so though you can do the same. Um, let me make sure the same works. OK, first let's do some uh, definitions. Because everybody talks about probiotic, and then you frequently see the term prebiotic. Mm -hmm. And the other term you see a lot is microbiome. Now, probiotic, I don't know why they invented the term. Can you hear me back there? Mm -hmm. But all it means, a probiotic is an organism, a microorganism, usually bacteria, but also could be parasites or viruses, that are in a host. A host meaning an animal, like a dog, a human, a rat. And they're microorganisms that live on, you know, like the skin or in, like in the mouth or in the gut, in that host or that animal. And the key is they confer some benefit, right, to that host. So a probiotic is a microorganism, a little bacteria, that lives in or on some animal and gives that animal some kind of benefit. So because you've got that animal or that microorganism in you, you're better in some way. That's what a probiotic is. So a prebiotic, I don't know why they keep, prebiotic is, it's not very exciting, and, and you can really kind of ignore it. Prebiotic is simply probiotic food. It's stuff that they eat. And a lot is made <coughs> in the lay literature and vitamin supplements with this is a good prebiotic and that's not. But prebiotic pretty much is anything organic. You know, whatever you put in your mouth, hopefully is organic, and the bacteria can eat it, right? They can digest it. So prebiotics, who cares? A lot of the probiotic supplements now will advertise the fact that, oh, we have built-in prebiotic. But all you got to do is eat dinner, breakfast, or lunch, and you're supplying these microorganisms with food, right? And then the final one is the microbiome. <clears throat> and the microbiome just means, if you're talking about me, my microbiome is every single organism on or in me, in my gut, in my mouth, on my skin, viruses, bacteria. My microbiome is a big grouping of all kinds of bacteria. Okay? That's all it is. So now the NIH and other people are talking about microbiome research. What we're trying to do is figure out how all this fits together. There's a ton of data available already, but there it's incredibly complex, and I'll tell you why. And there is a huge amount of research now being uh, pursued. So, <clears throat> I mean, bacteria. These are a bifidobacterium. Bifidobacterium, it's a phyla that, that has a lot of probiotics in it. In other words, microorganisms that give us benefit. That's just a photomicrograph picture. And here's a woman, and, you know, where do they all hang out? Well, in her mouth, her nose, you know, the upper part of the respiratory system, the lungs are supposed to be sterile. There are microorganisms in there. Most of the probiotics, most of them, are in your gut. Upper gut, lower gut, mid gut, they're all in there. Different, different types in different places. Mainly, uh, in large part, the mid and the lower gut. They're on your skin. I mean, the ones up here are different than the ones here, different than the ones here, you know, different than the ones between your toes, but there are lots on your skin. <coughs> and the urogenital tract. So they're all over. <clears throat> and it's not a bad thing. You know, we have this prejudice in our culture that bacteria are bad. Wash your hands. Oh, oh look out, there's a bacteria. Don't eat that. You know, it's dirty. <clears throat> From our standpoint, homo sapiens sapiens, the bacteria that associate with us are universally good, period. They are universally good. The bad bacteria that we think about, everything from salmonella to syphilis to everything else, Speaking as an infectious disease specialist, 
Most of those come from crowding, which comes from the civilization and come from our ability eight to 10,000 years ago to domesticate animals. A lot of these things we got from animals. And a lot of these things we got from crowding the civilization. Before eight to 10,000 years ago, you all were, they looked, you looked exactly like you do now, but you were in hunter-gatherer groups, small family groups, you wandered around. And frankly, other than getting eaten by tigers and bears and stuff, you were, in many respects, probably healthier than we are today. I hear all the, mm -hmm. Charlene, you haven't interrupted you. What? <laughs> now, don't get me wrong, I love Charlene, but you're going to hear her opinion on all this pretty soon. So what do they do? What do the probiotics do? They're bacteria. What they do in our bodies and the other animal bodies, and there's no reptile, bird, fish, mammal on the planet that doesn't have their own microbiome, period. It's just the way it is. They break down complex polysaccharides, sugar-like agents, carbohydrate-like agents <coughs> in the stuff we eat, and they produce a whole host. This, the breakdown products are a whole host of compounds, chemical compounds, that affect every bodily system, your brain, your heart, your lungs, your immune system, mainly, uh, everything. So they're constantly taking your food and doing things with it, and that stuff is inside you, and it's circulating, and it's affecting all your systems, <clears throat> including the immune system. They themselves, they're bacteria, they're microorganisms. They produce their own biologically active chemicals, including antibiotics. This is cool. <clears throat> I used to do a lot of speaking for meetings and stuff from the ID standpoint. One of the questions was, how old is you know, the oldest antibiotic? People would say, oh, 1948 and 1936 Salversand or something like that. Probably the, the, real, the first antibiotics are probably two and a half billion years old, and they were created and produced. Now, if you're a creationist, that's great, but I'm talking about evolution. But they were produced by microorganisms when the first microorganisms theoretically came around about three billion years ago. So bacteria produce their own antibiotics to compete with other bacteria. So our microbiome, those microorganisms, are producing antibiotics in addition to a lot of other chemicals. All these chemicals, all these things are circulating inside us, and you don't think they're affecting our immune system, our brain, our heart, everything else? They are, and they have been for millions of years. It's the way it works. And if they weren't there, we'd be in big trouble. And part of the reason we're kind of in the chronic disease, modern, not too healthy situation is because We've messed, modern civilization has messed with our microbiomes. So, and finally, this is cool, they compete. They're very efficient competitors with bad bugs. There are bad bugs out there, right? They compete very efficiently. So you think of them as your police force or you know, your Marine Corps in your body. They're very efficient. So they do a ton of different things. So what problems can they solve? Now, this is a little tongue-in-cheek, but you know, really, diabetes and obesity? Yeah, there's huge data now to support that we can probably dramatically, positively impact obesity, glucose intolerance, diabetes, by modifying the microbiome. Depression and anxiety, yes. Why do you see some of this data? This will knock your socks off. Because these organisms are involved in neuroendocrine uh, uh, modulation. Uh, weak immune system, yes. Uh, predisposition to malignancies, yes. Most GI problems, inflammatory bowel disease, you know this. You've probably seen the effect on C. diff. One of the best ways to prophylax against C. diff is with high dose effective probiotic. And now we ID guys frequently will take people off flagell or vancomycin, put them on super high dose, like BSL-3 or something, and take care of the problem. And otherwise, it's not taken care of. Resistant bacteria, definitely. Problem skin, arthritis, a bunch of other medical conditions where I figure this world peace, maybe. <laughs> uh, needless to say, I'm a big believer in probiotics. So, how long have we had the microbiome with these probiotics inside and on us? I mean, it's all the species, mammalian, reptilian, you know, everybody has a microbiome with probiotics. So, Homo sapiens, 
you know, we've been, Homo sapiens sapiens, according to evolution, we've been around 250,000 years, but we've looked the same for the last 1 million to 500,000 years. We've always had a microbiome, and it is evolved along with us. <coughs> so, that's just the way that is. And then, uh, how big is it? This, this will surprise you. Now, you look at the cells. We're made up of cells, right? Mm -hmm. We're made up of a bunch of cells. Well, the microbial cells, which again are like a tenth to a hundred smaller than our own cells, in our bodies, our, our system here, we, the microbial cells outnumber our human cells ten to a hundred to one. So if you look at me, I'm more bacteria than I am human. Okay? Charlene, let's see. <laughs> oh, it's coming. <laughs> So that's a hundred, only a hundred trillion organisms in or on each one of us, hundred trillion. But they're essential and they're universally positive. Uh, the number of microbiome genes in a single individual, so me for instance, outnumbers my human genes by a factor of one or greater. So here's a provocative question. Are we more us or are we more them? Think about that. I mean, there's never been a time in your life where you were all human. Because you just weren't, right? Actually, when you were in utero, you were sterile. You were all human, which is kind of cool. The second you were born, you started to get your mother's uh, microbiome and populate. And if you hadn't, you wouldn't be around today. So, are we more us or are we more them? And then the second question I like even more, who's here for who? I mean, are we here for them? You know what I mean? Or are they here for us? Are they supposed to make us live better? Or are we supposed to be here taking care of them, a place to live? So, <clears throat> this is too teeny, but this uh, shows you, this is uh, actually from the Microbiome NIH project. And the taxa is incredibly complicated. Each individual, you know, if you take my microbiome, I have at least a thousand uh, subspecies of bacteria. A thousand. That's crazy. Have you looked on the shelves and tried to go buy some probiotics? Mm -hmm. I mean, the manufacturers that have been seven, they like, they brag, they go, whoa, we have seven. These guys only have three, they only have two. Seven compared to a thousand. So we're just beginning to learn this stuff. Uh, anyway, these are different locations and different taxa. So there are myriad types of organisms. Some we've heard about, you know, uh, in terms of being in clinical medicine like we are, some we haven't. So each biome, over, over, over a thousand different bacterial species. And again, the average probiotic only has a few, but it's a start. You can still make yourself healthier, safer, better by using probiotics. And I'll talk to you about that, but the practical side of things. The most common phyla, whoops, the most common phyla represented Bacteroides and Firmicutes, but Bacteroides, I'm not talking about Bacteroides fragiles, I'm talking about the phyla of organisms, the big, you know, and then they have all these species and subspecies that spill out. Uh, Acinetobacter, uh, Proteobacter, Fusobacteria. These are the big phyla, and most of the, there are, there are others, but these phyla contribute most to the bacteria that are present in our microbiome. <coughs> so, Diversity is huge, um, and it tends to be unique to each individual. Yours tends to kind of stay the same unless you do something about that. And uh, species tend to stay similar. Environment is very big. Your origins, family origin, community origin is very big. Um, <coughs> so, are we learning more about this, and do we care? Remember the genome sequencing project, which actually ended up being somewhat of a discipline where we're finding that, you know, it's like a complex world. Human beings, it's not all about genes, right? Mm -hmm. So the human genome is sequenced. Now what we're doing, the NIH is spending only $173 million on doing the human microbiome project. And now what we're doing is trying to map and sequence the predominant microbiome in human beings. So because we know it's involved in a huge number of health states, you know, disease states and health states. And they're essential for normal physiology, normal function. So there's a huge, it started in uh, 2007. It'll be a longer project than the human, geno uh, human genome sequencing project, 80 collaborating universities, 
this is the initial price tag, 173 million. Obviously, it's going to be higher than that. And it'll give us a lot of good information. So here's the logo. I don't know if you've seen this thing around. But this is a big, big, big item at the NIH and the worldwide in terms of the next big um, <coughs> scientific endeavor in the infectious disease world. But it may be in the infectious disease world, but it affects chronic diseases, your arthritis, malignancies, immunodeficiency, a whole host of things. Uh, so it's, it's very, very important. And most governments and large academic institutions are very much focused on this initiative. So where do we get our microbiome? You know, in utero, we're sterile, right? We're no bugs. We're born. The second we come out the birth canal, we're covered with mother's organisms, fortunately. And then we nurse. And uh, you know, colostrum has all kinds of immunologic factors in it. And there's, you know, organisms on the breast and touching. There's constant environmental and human contact that gives that child its microbiome. And you'll see when you do, if you look at cytokine production right after birth for the first few days, you'll see this cytokine like IL-6 and TNF burst from these foreign antigens suddenly coming into this naive baby and sparking the immune system. You're like sparking the immune system to wake up and get going and develop. So that's why, if you're interested in the hygiene hypothesis, babies that are born, C-section, they don't quite get this. You know, they get the sterile environment over here in OB gin, which is fine, because you don't want infections in the womb, but, but it's a different deal. And those children have, they're okay, but they have higher rates, you know, atp and asthma and so forth. That can be reversed in some sense and ameliorated by breastfeeding and close human contact. But it's a consideration if they sit in the neonatal, neonatal ICU for a long period of time and are not breastfed and don't have the other organisms. So mom gives you your microbiome, and then your brothers and sisters, and your, the family dog, and everybody else. <laughs> so are, they, are our microbiomes healthy? Ours today, 2015, do you think our microbiomes are healthy? They're not. They're not healthy, comparatively speaking. We're too clean. And I, this is not so much tongue-in-cheek. This, this is the way it is. You're, you know, you're, if you look at a yardstick, let's say we took a, a one yard long yardstick, <coughs> three feet, and we say here's time zero and here's 2015. This is how long we've been, um, you know, genetically stable as Homo sapiens sapiens. So this represents, I don't know, 250 to 500,000 years. The agricultural revolution, which gives us animals and, and modern civilization and this the beginning of the modification of our microbiome is way out here, like, like you know, a sixteenth of an inch on the end of this yardstick. We didn't evolve to do that, right? We've evolved to be hunter-gatherers, running around, falling down. Do you think? Do you think they washed the the grapes they pulled off the tree, or the 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 stuff? First of all, we're not very good hunters, so. A lot of the stuff was rotting meat and stuff that you find on the plains, and you pick it up and you eat it, and you get organisms from it. You think we washed everything off? You think we did the Purell thing on our hands and all that? Your ancestors didn't do any of that. Everybody slobbered on everybody else, and nobody washed it. But it's funny, but, it, but it's the way we developed, and we developed, and it had impact, positive impact. So we're too clean. The hygiene hypothesis says that in modern society, because we are so clean and our food tends to be sterile, that we don't get the immunologic antigenic stimulation from foreign organisms that we need to protect ourselves against chronic disease, the arthritis now. One of the postulates is it's related to the hygiene hypothesis. We're too clean, so our immune system isn't robust enough to take care of some of these other issues. And atopy, asthma, uh, things like this uh, are a result. Our food is too sterile. We don't play in the dirt enough anymore. You know, don't grow up on the farm. We take too many antibiotics. That's my fault. Mm -hmm. I mean, we constantly take antibiotics. These can certainly be life, life saving, yes, right? Is. But, I mean, they're life saving. But the second you do this, you better do something to replete the microbiome, to put something back, okay, after you've gotten rid of that pathogenic organism. And we don't do that. We take other medications that interfere with the microbiome. Think about that. We're on all kinds of PPIs and other medications. And, you know, 
if you if you look closely at the literature, you know, any hypertensives and any arthri arthritis medicines, all these different medicines have effects other than just treating your high blood pressure or your arthritis. They have other effects. Um, and we don't get regular doses of fermented organic material. Your hunter-gatherer ancestors, the, the anthropologists tell us, were always eating stuff that had dirt on it and bugs on it, and whether it was fermented or not, a lot of the stuff was fermented. And if it wasn't, it had organisms from the environment on it. And then finally, we, we bathe a lot. You know, we constantly are bathing and washing part of our microbiome off. And one of the side areas of investigation in skin cancer is whether we are harming ourselves. You know, the, the rates of melanoma are like skyrocketing. The rates of other types of skin cancer. Are we harming ourselves by washing too much and taking off protective layers of special oils? Many, much of the constituents of the oils are bacterial byproducts, right, of the organisms that live on our skin. Are we harming ourselves, increasing our predisposition to skin cancers because we wash all the time? Um, so, let's just take two examples. I talked about all these disease states where there's a lot of evidence that probiotics can play a role, the microbiome plays a role. We'll just take two examples. Let's talk about, in this instance, anxiety, depression, psych psychiatric disorders, psychological disorders, and the next example will be obesity and diabetes, because we can't talk about all of them. We only have, well, how many more minutes do I have, five or something? Fifteen. Fifteen. So let's look at this. You wouldn't believe the amount of data, predominantly animal data, looking at this topic. Looking at mice mainly, and there's some dog data and other animal data, looking at anxiety states and depression in animals related to what the makeup of their microbiome is. Some of this work is with germ-free mice. You know, we have in a lab now germ-free mice and germ-free uh, organisms. Let me turn this off. And um, so there's a lot of good work that's been done, and some preliminary human work. So there is a constant bi-directional communication between the gut and the central nervous system. The central nervous system, that's your brain. And remember I talked about early on what do the probiotics do? You know, they, in, in uh, digesting all these polysaccharides, they create a whole variety of biologically active mediators that are then circulating. And the microorganisms produce their own biologically active, active, uh, biologically active mediators, right? Two, two different things. So there is a constant communication between the gut because of the microorganisms and the central nervous system. And you know, the way our body works is, is there are the communication, some of it's hardwired, right, with like nerves. Most of it is circulating mediators, peptides, uh, a whole variety of uh, chemicals that communicate. Look at, look at, you know, your, what does your Prozac do? It makes your serotonin go up, and some of them make your dopamine go up as well, and you get happier. So, these organisms and their products and their regulatory capability help regulate how the body influences the brain. Um, and in fact, we know enough now to know that a healthy microbiome is essential to normal central nervous system homeostasis. Homeostasis meaning Everything is cool, everything is running smoothly. Um, probiotics assist in regulating uh, hypothalamic pituitary axis function. Germ-free mice get exaggerated stress cortisol responses, which is corrected by probiotics. Germ-free, they don't have the bugs there. You put the probiotics in, they're be they better regulate their hypo uh, hypothalamic pituitary axis. Stress, anxiety, depression. Um, anxiety and depression modulated by the HPA axis. The psychiatrist will tell you that. Now this, this got cut off. This is a huge number of, this thing goes on like three more, but I couldn't, I'm not a tech wizard, obviously. I was trying to stick it all on there, but these are all animal studies. Uh, this I have to answer, I'm sorry. Hello? Hello? Yeah. Uh, can I call you back, Kimber, in 10, or is this urgent? I'm doing a brown bag. All right, bye. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, if you look at these individual animal studies, they're very well done. They're very compelling. And what do they show? They show you that uh, your microbiome constituents 
help to regulate and control stress, anxiety, and depression states in animals. It's easy. You can measure depression in animals. They've been doing it forever, including anxiety states and then stress modulators. So, uh, multiple studies demonstrate predictable changes in behavior based on modification of the rodent microbiome, happy, sad, stress. Uh, they also point to the connection between in inflammation and behavior and stress. You know, a lot of the new psychiatric research now is focusing on the involvement of, of uh, inflammation in anxiety and stress disorders, having to do with it's somehow involved in modulation of the, of the GABA system and the HPA system. So it's very important. And a big part of your um, uh, inflammation modulation comes from what your microbiome looks like. Uh, and, they, and the probiotics clearly affect inflammation states. So a number of lim limited studies in humans with uh, a bifidobacterium longum, Helveticus, this is a lactobacillus, lactobacillus casei, <coughs> demonstrates significant reduction in depression, anxiety, and stress disorders. You know, there are two companies out there now. I have a friend, he's another ID guy who's involved in a probiotics company. Two companies out there now coming out with the, the uh, probiotic to make you less depressed, make you less anxious, make you happier. I want that one. Me too. Huh? <laughs> well, you, you, there, some of this you can do already. Uh, BDNF, brain-derived neurotropic factor, which is a huge, huge topic in neurodegenerative diseases, whether it's ALS, uh, multiple sclerosis, they're looking very carefully at this factor, is modulated by probiotics. Um, BDNF production and modulation controlled by aspects of the microbiome. Uh, GABA, that's, that, that's another um, you know, communication system, is strongly implicated by the psychiatry research community in anxiety and depression, also produced and modulated by the microbiome. So, yeah, I mean, you think, oh, okay, I'm taking my probiotics, so I'm regular. Okay, well, that happens. Or I'm taking it so I don't get, I don't know, turista when I go to Mexico. Okay, well, that's going to work too. But nobody was thinking a few years ago involvement in all these other systems. And it makes sense, doesn't it? Because there's more of them than us, and they've been around ever since we've been around. So, and it's been a, you know, if it, if it wasn't good, those people died. And then the people who reproduced were the ones where it was good. A good symbiotic relationship. So let's switch gears quickly. Talk about obesity and diabetes. Very closely connected, obviously, because of glucose intolerance issues. There's a study. 2013 study done at the, uh, through a grant at the NIH, VSL3. You have VSL3 in your formula. Do you know that? Right here in this hospital. This is the one I use that we grow at home and feed to the fam. It's um, <coughs> it's a commercial. It's used a lot by the gastroenterologists, and we'll talk about that in a minute. You know, the, the commercial products for probiotics are all over the map, and let's remember to talk about that for a little advice because you can spend a lot of money for not much of anything. Anyway. This is a very reputable brand. <coughs> Prevented weight gain and insulin resistance in mice. This has been repeated several different times, now being looked at in human studies. Uh, and how did that happen? Well, GLP-1 is an endogenous appetite suppressing hormone, which is supposed to work properly. You know, you're supposed to eat a little bit, and then it kicks in and you stop eating. Instead of what I do, you know, one chocolate chip cookie, two, three, four, and on and on. <laughs> so what happens is the VSL3, which is a common, you know, probiotic, uh, it has a, a I believe, um, we have seven or 12. Is there a pharmacist here? It either has seven or 12 strains, I don't remember. But a couple of the strains in there are the strains that have been linked with weight loss. Anyway, um, they lead to production in the in the organism of um, butyrate, which is a short chain fatty acid. Butyrate is the main control mechanism for stimulating GLP-1. Isn't that cool? So this probiotic turns on butyrate, and then it upregulates GLP-1, and you lose your appetite goes away, and it's better. You get better. You don't gain all that weight. So probiotic ingestion has been shown to modify numerous metabolic pathways, including a lot of carbohydrate metabolism pathways and carbohydrate metabolism, you know, that's a big deal in diabetes mellitus and in obesity, and weight control. And this is really cool. These are cool studies. <laughs> Microbiomes of obese and lean animals and people are different and transferable one to the other. You know, there are a couple of studies. Now, you've heard of the um, 
fecal transplant where they take poo from person A and they mix it up in some saline and the gastroenterologist put it in their scope and they basically inject it into your fanny or up above into your gut and then you have a new set of organisms. Well, what do you think happened with the studies where they took Mr. Skinny and they took his microbiome and they injected it into Mr. Big? What do you think happened? Mr. Big lost his weight. Now he looks like Mr. Skinny. I mean, these are these are cool studies, and this is this is in progress. This kind of work, uh, and vice versa. And they've done twin studies. There are twin studies in humans showing uh, transferability. Uh, really, really cool stuff. Uh, let's see. So here's the SL3. It's in your it's in your pharmacy. So we, we should all leave here and like kick down the door. <laughs> Tie up the pharmacist and steal other vehicles. Is it a prescription? No. The, only, the, the, the capsules and these small packets are not prescription. There's a giganto dose, which I use in inflammatory bowel people, like 900 billion per sachet. It's prescription, but it's a gimmick. Why, why should a doctor have to write a prescription for that? It's a gimmick. Right. But no, you can, you can order VSL3 from Walgreens and Get it? You don't have to have a prescription. It's just that this company publishes their data. They're they're real. Their stuff is real. It's not fluff, you know. You know you're getting what is advertised. The FDA doesn't control probiotic development. So there are a lot of companies out there, fly by night companies, where and I'll tell you how to pick a good product, but remind me about that. Okay. Uh, so should I you do this? Because obviously it's a good thing to do uh, for lots of reasons. Prophylactically, right? Like a lot of people, oh, I take a vitamin. I exercise every day. I do it prophylactically. So I hopefully reduce my chances of getting this, 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 and this. We do a lot of prophylactic things, right? Meditation. Um, or should I wait for Uncle Sam to figure it all out? They're never going to figure it all out. It's incredibly. And who, who thinks they're smarter than Mother Nature? Raise your hand. So, go ahead, Charlie. Raise your hand. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, I would do it. I do it. My family does it. They're like, oh, Dad, oh, God, I drink this sloth again. Is it safe? It's absolutely safe. It's, what's remarkable is, uh, appropriately, oncologists will worry if, if maybe their immunosuppressed patients are taking probiotics because they're you know, dumping bacteria in. There are only two or three case reports of systemic infections by an organism that came from a probiotic, and two of those are suspect, and one may be real. But it was in a dramatically immunosuppressed person. Why would you give that person that probiotic? But they're incredibly safe, and there's a ton of literature to support that, which is really comforting. Um, is it cheap? If you do it right, it's super cheap. Is it easy? It's ultra easy. Will you tell me how? Yes, I'm going to tell you. So your choices. If you want it until the NIH figures it all out. We know enough now, I know enough now, to know that it's definitely beneficial. So, <clears throat> you can take a pill every day, right? You can get VSL3. Everybody's got a new company now, or you can get, four, you know, you can get whatever you want and take pills every day. This you have to be a little careful because uh, some of my ID colleagues and I, we've, when this first started happening 10, 15 years ago, we would go around and buy stuff off the shelf. And you can do it. You, can take, you take it home, you heat up some milk, right? And you put this on there, you stir it up, and you cover it with a towel, and you stick it on the counter. And you wait 12 to 24, maybe 36, at the latest 48 hours. If it doesn't turn and gel like, you know, like kefir or like yogurt, it isn't any good. It means the organisms are dead. They won't do you any good at all. It's just stupid powder. So when we started doing this, there were plenty of companies where you couldn't grow anything out. That's worthless. Most of the companies are too smart for that now. You know? So what I say is, you can try it yourself, that's kind of a waste of money, or just get, start now, get, you know, just get some VSL3. And you can grow it yourself. You don't have to keep buying new VSL3. All you need is a few capsules and you make your own start. So, you know, how do you keep yourself? You can take a pill every day, that's expensive. You can make your own. It's fun, it's cheaper, it's easier. You can eat probiotic rich foods, which is all cultures all over the world have some kind of probiotic food. Fermented milk, tempeh, uh, kimchi. I have a like. I'm one of the few Americans who likes kimchi. I think it's tasty. Uh, 
sauerkraut, fermented milk products, fermented vegetables. Um, and you can do this at home. I mean, it's easy, it's fun, uh, it's cool, and it's obviously very healthy. Um, can you make your own foods? Yes. And uh, what, what's a good idea? You know Joseph Mercola, do you know this? Uh, it's a very interesting website. It's free. Get on there. And there's a bunch of stuff on there, but focus in on the fermented foods. Or go on Amazon and look for a, you know, there, there are a million books like ferment, you know, fermentation with dummies or easy fermentation or beginning fermentation. I have a number of them. And you can learn how to do this. And then for starter, you can do it de novo. Just you don't have to have a starter. It's easier to get a starter and then, it, then you can use it again and again and again. We eat, in my family, we eat fermented foods like almost every day. And we drink probiotic that we make at home. So, if you there's an issue here, you know, you can be lactose intolerant or not. Let's say you're not lactose intolerant, so you can eat milk products. You take the milk, this is very sophisticated now, you go get some whole milk, you put it in a Pyrex container, this is what, you know, those big Pyrex things, you put it in the microwave or you heat it up on the stove till it's, till you can put your pinky in there for at least 30 seconds. You don't have to wash your pinky, remember, we're washing too much. So. <laughs> and uh, so it's warm. It's pretty warm, but not hot. Because if it's too hot, it's going to kill the probiotics, right? So you don't want it too hot. So then you take one of these capsules, a VSL-3 capsule, or one of these capsules, assuming that it's a good probiotic and it's alive. You open it up and you put it on. You let it dissolve for a minute. Then you stir it up. You know. Then you cover it with the towel. You don't put it in the freezer. You stick it on the counter the dog away from you, stick it on the counter. And you check it every 12 hours or so. It's, it's a lot of fun. And you'll just put the spoon and you go, whoa, look at this. And it's kind of, you know, it's kind of like uh, like a liquid yogurt. You'll see it's thickened. And you, the longer you leave it, the more it may become a little chunky and you get the whey and the curd and all that. But wait till it's thick, right? And then what I do is we, we just pour it in the wax carton that we got the milk in, label it and stick it in the fridge and then you just like drink a glass of that every day. The problem with yogurt that you buy, there are live active cultures in there, but they're not as many. You get gazillions in this, which is what you need. You've got to overcome, you know, the gastric barrier when you're drinking it. And the yogurt, yeah, it's helpful. It's but but the quantity is not as high. So we've we we do not I mean we eat yogurt for taste, but we don't do it for the probiotics. We make our own. All you need is one of those capsules. And then, uh, you stick it in the fridge and you, you leave it there. And it doesn't go bad because these guys are like the Marines. If a bad bug hops in that thing, he's toast. Because there are all these healthy probiotics in there. I mean, it just, it's just the way it is. Because people are so nervous from a culture like, oh my God, I left it on the counter overnight. Oh my God. It's, you know, it's just, it's okay. So then you take a quarter cup of that stuff and you put a little plastic baggie or a little... And you freeze it, maybe freeze three or four and stick them in the freezer. So when you run out, you take that, you put it in your warm milk, stir it up, and that's your starter, just like sourdough. And it goes on and on and on. So maybe you only have one capsule. Or you can buy a $30 bottle and use it up every week or two weeks. So we just make it ourselves. And if you're lactose intolerant, then eat the fermented foods, right? Or there, you know what kefir is, right? You can order water kefir grains. You get water and you put some kind of carbohydrate sugar in it and you put in the grains and you'll make like a, you can make like a carbonated drink and you can put uh, you know, fruit in there and all kinds of stuff. You don't have to drink milk. I'm okay with milk, so. So, <coughs> your references, that's it. What, what are your questions? <laughs> well, people being people, is there any chance you can overdo it? I mean, we've overdone antibiotics, so what's to keep us from overdoing probiotics and screwing stuff up? Hard to do, really hard to do. I mean, like, because, um, and that's a good question, because everybody in the healthcare community thinks about that. Well, we, you know, antibiotics were the panacea in the 40s and the 50s, and we've obviously overdone those. Well, What's, I mean, you can see it. Everybody in this room has been going, oh, my God, this is awesome. And you can see everybody's going to go down to the grocery store and start doing this. But what's, ever, what's to keep everybody from overdoing it and getting sicker if you overdo it? I mean, we have a tendency in this culture to overdo everything. Mm -hmm. You're right. 
Uh, what I can say is that what our tendency is, is to underdo it so that we don't take in enough, it gets killed off in our GI tract and then we don't deliver, you know, to the lower GI tract. But um, that's where the safety literature comes in, you know. The, like there, the, the, the concept of the LD50, the lethal dose 50, you know, mm -hmm. where uh, this many organisms kills half the people and the other right. half live. It's, it does, doesn't seem to be, you can't, get, you can't get those numbers, you know? It's a very good question, but it looks like the preponderance of data is that, um, that it's very safe. Now, what I would, I would take one part of that question is like, well, which are the ones that are going to help me, right, and keep me healthy? And people don't have that answer yet. One way to get to that is to, you know, there's some websites, uh, there's a, culture, something, is to go to the, 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 these fermented foods that people have been eating for hundreds and thousands of years. And like there are all kinds of uh, yogurt starters and things you can order from that have been around forever. Like uh, we, have, we have a bunch of them actually that we keep in the freezer, like Icelandic Vili and all these different kinds of fermented milks. You know, I've done a fair amount of traveling and every culture I've seen has some kind of fermented milk, everything from Afghanistan to Pakistan to, um, to uh, Tanzania to Zaire. I mean, everybody's drinking some kind of fermented milk. And the microorganisms are similar but also varied. Uh, so what, what we do is, uh, I know that the organisms in DSL-3, I know those organisms, and I look at the literature, and those are organisms that are thought to be offer benefits, various kinds of benefits. So I use those, and then I use some of the historic cultures like Vili, which is I think an Icelandic fermented milk. You can order starters online and stuff. But um, I, nobody knows what the magic formula is. But what we do, what we do feel comfortable with is that if you take in some fermented product on a regular basis, whether it's a yogurt or fermented milk or fermented vegetables, that you should be healthier. But the answer on what's the perfect combination for depression and anxiety, nobody knows that yet. What's the difference between a papaya enzyme and a BL3? Well, an enzyme is a protein that okay. breaks. This, These are actually organisms. Okay. Enzymes are little peptides and protein products. They're not alive. They digest certain things, break up certain large organic molecules. Uh, these actually are little bacteria. Now, these are lyophilized, so you, you bring them to life when you, you grow them up. So probiotics are alive. They're like swimming, dancing little bacteria and stuff that are alive. Enzymes are uh, protein peptides that digest certain organic but they can be produced by, they're produced by you know, bodies and produced by organisms. And stuff. So papaya enzyme is an enzyme in papaya that helps digest it. In my old country, I was being told that I need to eat yogurt when I'm on antibiotics. Yeah. I'm not hearing this anymore. Is something changed or is this culture? No, difference? your grandmother was smarter than we are today. I mean, I, I do think, I will tell people that I've given the antibiotics to, I said, well, go home and eat, you know, get, take this VSL-3 for two weeks, at least to just repopulate you, or go eat some yogurt and say, no, that's, uh, and almost all cultures have a fermented food tradition. So, no, that's, that's, uh, the, the only thing is, I usually tell people, like, if you're on a broad-spectrum antibiotic, let's say you're on Flagyl and Imipenem or something, well, I'm, it's going to kill everything in here. So you might as well wait until, okay, I finished it on Tuesday, I started my probiotic on Wednesday or Tuesday night, because then it's kind of a waste of money. Except that unless you're on an ice, you know, one antibiotic and it's killing some but not the others. So, but it's, you know, look how complex it is. One microbiome, a minimum of a thousand subspecies of bacteria. That's a thousand, that's a huge number. And how do they all interact? How do they do what they do? We're getting information now to know that this one is involved in this, and this one is involved in this. 
and this family or this phyla is involved in this. So we kind of enrich for those. But it's a huge story, and it's not all, it's, the story's just sort of begun. But I mean, if you look at history and anthropology, a lot of these people, a lot of these people are very healthy. You know, they die of other things. You know, they get bombs dropped on their head, or, you know, or, or they get starved to death. But uh, so there's a lot of historic data to support that eating fermented foods is a healthy thing. Now, of course, you don't want to eat botulism, or you don't want to eat, you know, salmonella. But you know where the salmonella comes from in that salad or your egg? That's like mass production, super farmed, crowded, antibiotic laden. You know, the agricultural industry gives way more antibiotics than we do. Way more. Our problem with resistant organisms really comes from the agricultural industry. You know that. Cows, sheep, chickens, everything. They're loaded with antibiotics. And, uh, and some of them, this is cool, some of them are fed certain probiotics that are known to cause weight gain. So let's avoid those, you know. Yeah. But uh, it's used in, in agriculture. And they use probiotics to keep their crowded <coughs> feedlot cows from getting diarrhea. Well, why don't you just free range them? Well, it's not practical, but uh, they use probiotics now. And all, you know, baby, uh, you know, uh, they use them on uh, all kinds of animals. I have yeah. a question, um, uh -huh. and it has to do with, uh, especially people in obesity or, or wanting to go on a diet, and so they say, don't eat sugar, use Splenda. So all of the so-called artificial sweeteners are supposedly, I've heard, reacting with the gut in a negative way. Yeah. you know what? So what is that? Do they know? I don't know, but you know what? I'm going to sound like a real... I, uh, I don't I don't eat anything that uh, anymore that's uh, not you know not food <laughs> yeah not food you if it has a label on it be careful you know that's my attitude frankly because I, I have heard that I'm serious didn't know if I'm serious. sorry I've just seen you eat and I know that's not yeah, true yeah I know that okay <laughs> I told you Charlene was going to check <laughs> No, I, I'm a carb addict. I love us. I love cookies and chocolate and all that stuff. But no, I mean, uh, I, I think all that stuff is. Uh, I don't want to get political here, but I. Is yeah, it I actually know. killing the bacteria? In, oh no, I don't. I don't know. I'd have to go read about that. No, but know. it doesn't feed it. You know, aspartame. You know the aspartame story, don't you? you well, that's what I'm talking about. Aspartame and all these. Aspartame was voted down by the initial FDA scientific review panel when it first came up like 30 years ago or something. You know the story. And then, uh, <coughs> um, so, and what was the company? So it wasn't going to get approved until the company, after he left the Ford administration, or the Nixon administration, it was our past... Uh, Secretary of Defense, what's it, Rumsfeld, right? He was mm -hmm. a lobbyist, and he went, to, he got it approved. He went back, and they, and they, they got it approved. Aspartame is a neurotoxin. Oh, wow. You should see what it does to rats and mice. There's a ton of data. Oh, everything Aspartame is poison. And mice. <laughs> yeah. so, Sorry. Right? It's in, it's in your Diet Coke, and it's in a bunch of other stuff. I, I wouldn't drink it. Yeah. How do you tell in a grocery store or a drugstore which is a good probiotic? If people didn't want to spend money on it. Which are the good ones? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, VSL three is reliable. You know, you, I mean, you don't know what you're getting unless you. What I do is, uh, I take them home and grow them. If they grow, there's something there. You know, and you read what's on the side, and you look for the names. I mean, I do. I am familiar with the names of so the commonly, the ones that we know a lot about. And they have different varying, and so the companies have gotten pretty smart now. They're putting, they're putting those strains in their probiotics. So you have to go like it. I just bought this because I was giving this talk today. Bought it at Walgreens. But um, so I'm going to go get some milk and heat it up and grow it in my little call room. And if it grows, then at least there's something in it that's viable. You don't know if they're all viable. But the VSL3, they know they have a big medical market with gastroenterologists, so they're really very, you know, all their data is. 
peer reviewed and they publish and you know exactly how they do what they do. They do a lot of testing, it's more expensive. At least you know that what they say you're getting, you're getting. And on the shelf, you know it's going to stay alive for a period of time. Otherwise, they, they pull it beyond a certain time. The rest of these, they'll say, oh, you know, live. Well, they were live when they went on the shelf, but who knows, two weeks later, two months later. They don't, FDA doesn't require them to say any of that. So, but you can find out yourself. Just try to grow it. If it doesn't grow, and if it doesn't grow, then a few days later, the the other stuff's going to come in, and that's going to smell like stinky, rotten milk, right? Because other organisms came in and 